and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be looking at the 2021 paper, focusing on the multiple choice section. You can find a link to this paper in the description box below. Let's have a look at question one. Aluminium carbonate is produced by reacting aluminium chloride and potassium carbonate in a precipitation reaction. This produces a solid within a solution. A suitable method for separating this would be filtration. Question 2 is testing your knowledge of trends in the periodic table. We're looking at the difference in size, or covalent radius, of sodium and chlorine. Covalent radius decreases as you move across the period. Sodium is in group 1 and chlorine is in group 7. Chlorine is smaller than sodium. Chlorine has more protons than sodium and therefore has an increased nuclear charge. This makes the covalent radius smaller. Covalent radius depends on the number of protons when comparing sodium and chlorine. In question 3, we're looking at carbon dioxide. We're looking at the strongest bonds broken in the process of turning carbon dioxide from a solid to a gas. The structure of carbon dioxide is important here. It is a linear, linear molecule with two polar bonds. However, it is symmetrical, therefore it is a non-polar molecule overall. This means the interactions between the molecules are London dispersion forces. These are the interactions that are broken when carbon dioxide goes from solid to gas. Question 4 is testing your understanding of electronegativity. Electronegativity is the attraction for a bonding pair of electrons. Elements which have high electronegativity have a high attraction for a bonding pair of electrons and therefore wish to gain electrons. This means that elements with high electronegativities tend to be reduced as reduction is gain of electrons. Question 5 is about viscosity. Viscosity is a measure of the thickness of a liquid. You can investigate this by dropping metal balls into tubes of liquid. Liquids where the ball takes longer to fall are more viscous. If we have a look at X and Y, we can see that the position of the ball is higher up in Y. Therefore, this is the more viscous of the two liquids. This allows us to eliminate A and D from the options, as X is the less viscous liquid. The more viscous the liquid is, then the stronger the intermolecular forces or van der Waals forces are. Therefore, Y has the stronger van der Waals forces. This gives C as our answer. Question 6 is looking at ionisation energy. Here you have beryllium and we have removed two electrons. This means that we need to add together the first and second ionisation energies for beryllium. Using the information in the databook, we can find that these two values are 900 and 1757. We add these two values together to get the total energy required to remove the two electrons as 2657. Question 7 is looking at isomers. Isomers have the same number of each type of atom within their structure. However, they're arranged differently. For this question, it's best to start by having a look at how many carbons are in the compound and have a check of the four options first, rather than sitting and trying drawing them all out. Pentanoic acid contains five carbons. 2-methylpropanoic acid only has four carbons, therefore cannot be an isomer. Propyl methanoate also contains four carbons and cannot be an isomer. Ethylbutanoic acid contains six carbons and also cannot be an isomer. Ethylpropanoate has five carbons and therefore will be our answer. Question 8 looks at functional groups. Let's take each of the answers in turn. Both painkillers are ketones. A ketone is a carbonyl group which is within the middle of a chain. Whilst both painkillers do contain a C double bond O, they are not ketones as they are part of larger functional groups. Aspirin contains a carboxyl group and an ester link. A carboxyl group is a C double bond O, OH, and an ester link is a C double bond O, O. We can see both of these in the aspirin molecule. Paracetamol contains a hydroxyl group and a carboxyl group. A hydroxyl group is an OH group and a carboxyl group is a C double bond O, OH. There is only a hydroxyl group present within paracetamol. Neither painkiller contains an amide link. An amide link is a C double bond O to an NH, which we can see in paracetamol. Therefore, B is the answer. 
Question 9 is looking at which of these alcohols would produce an acid when reacted with potassium dichromate. This is looking at oxidation chemistry. To produce an acid, we need to have a primary alcohol. This means that the OH group needs to be on the end of a chain. For alcohol number 1, this is primary, number 2 is secondary, 3 is tertiary and 4 is primary. Therefore, 1 and 4 will produce an acid. Question 10 is looking at the reduction of an aldehyde back to an alcohol. Let's look at the structure of 2-methylbutanol. 2-methylbutanol has a carbonyl group on carbon number 1 and a methyl group on number 2. There are four carbons in the main chain. When we reduce this back to an alcohol, we convert the carbonyl group back into a hydroxyl group. To do this, we need to add on two hydrogen atoms. This means that the structure gains two grams. Therefore, the gram formula mass, which was 86, will increase by two to be 88. Question 11 is looking at the reaction of sodium hydroxide to form sodium propanoate. This is a neutralization reaction where you would need to use propanoic acid as the acid. Propanoic acid has a C OOH group and has three carbons in total. Therefore, C will be the answer. Question 12 is looking at proteins. Proteins are denatured during cooking. During denaturing, proteins lose their shape. This happens when the chains of proteins break the intermolecular bonds between them. These intermolecular bonds could be hydrogen bonds. Therefore, B is the answer. Question 13 is comparing the properties of fats and oils. Here we are comparing fats to oils. If we look at the structure of fats, they are more saturated than oils. This is because they have less carbon to carbon double bonds. Because of their more saturated structure, this means that they have a more compact structure and are able to pack more closely together. This makes their intermolecular forces stronger and therefore more energy is required to melt them. So they have higher melting points than oils do. Question 14 is testing your understanding of antioxidants. Antioxidants are substances which are added to food to preserve them. To do this, antioxidants get oxidised in place of something else. If an antioxidant is getting oxidised, then this means that it will lose electrons and therefore be an electron donor. An antioxidant will donate these electrons to another species. This means that that species will be reduced. This means that antioxidants can also be described as reducing agents. Antioxidants can help deal with free radicals. They can also be described as free radical scavengers. Therefore, the answer here is oxidizing agents. Question 15 is looking at the steps of a free radical chain reaction. The propagation step in a reaction is one in which one radical will produce another radical. Answer A has two radicals meeting. This is a termination step. Answer B has chlorine splitting up into two radicals. This is an initiation step. C has two radicals joining, also a termination step, whereas D has one radical becoming another, and therefore propagation. Question 16 looks at rates of reaction. We're given temperatures and times. The answers refer to rate. So let's first calculate rate, which is 1 divided by time for each of the answers. We can then have a look at each of them in turn. Answer A says that a small rise in temperature results in a large increase in the rate of reaction. This can be seen from the answers, however, let's consider the other answers first. Activation energy increases with increasing temperature. Activation energy is not affected by the increasing temperature, so this is not the answer. If we were to double the temperature, we can have a look at the rate. If we double from 20 to 40, we can see that the rate does not double. The reaction is slowing down with increasing temperature. The reaction is not slowing down with increasing temperature. It is getting faster as the time is reducing or the rate is increasing. Therefore, A is indeed the answer. Question 17 also looks at rate of reaction. Here we're looking to find the concentration for the reaction which took five seconds to complete. The graph is given relative rate, so we need to turn the 5 seconds into rate by doing 1 divided by 5. This gives you a rate of 0.2. Using the graph, we can then read off what the concentration is. Each of the small boxes is worth 0.04.
Therefore, the concentration is 0 0.96. Answer D. Question 18 looks at energy diagrams. Here we're looking for an exothermic reaction. This is one in which it gives out heat. This means that the energy of the products needs to be lower than the energy of the reactants. So we can eliminate C and D. For something to take place at room temperature, it will need a low activation energy. This will be B. Question 19 is looking at molar volume. Here we're looking for which reaction has the products having half the volume of the reactants. In A, we have a ratio of 3 to 2. In B, we have a 1 to 1 ratio of gases. In C, we have a ratio of 4 to 2, which will be half. And in D, we have a ratio of 1 to 2, which is doubled. Therefore, C is the answer. Question 20 is a take on a percentage yield calculation. Here you've been given the actual moles of ester that are produced and the percentage yield. And you're needing to work backwards to how many moles of reactant would be required to give you this yield. So if we write out the equation for percentage yield, which is actual divided by theoretical times 100, and fill in the numbers that we have. So we have an 80% yield, we have an actual yield of 0 0.8 moles, and we're trying to work out the theoretical yield. If we rearrange this for theoretical yield, then we will get 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.8. This means the theoretical yield would be one mole. There is a one-to-one -one ratio between the product, the ester, and both of the reactants. Therefore, the moles of the alcohol and the carboxylic acid that would be required would be one for each of them. D. Question 21 is about an equilibrium reaction. We can see from the graph that by reducing the temperature you also reduce the yield of the product. This means that the forward reaction must be exothermic as increasing the temperature is pushing the reaction to the left rather than to the right. This means that A will be the answer. Question 22 is a calculation. We've been given the volume and the concentration of sulfuric acid which has been used. Therefore, we can calculate the moles of sulfuric acid by doing concentration times volume. This will be 0.2 times 0.05 as the volume needs to be in litres. This will give us a number of moles of 0.01 for sulfuric acid. Using the balanced equation, there is a 1 to 2 mole ratio between sulfuric acid and the potassium hydroxide. This means that 0.02 moles of potassium hydroxide were neutralized. Question 23 looks at chromatography. We have four amino acids, P, Q, R, and S. The question states that the larger molecules will travel a shorter distance from the baseline, and less polar molecules will travel a, a gr greater distance from the baseline. This means that Q, is the least polar of the molecules, and the R is the largest molecule. We now need to look at each of the statements. We have P is less polar than S. If we compare the location of P to S, P has traveled less far up the paper than S. This makes it more polar. Q is a larger molecule than P. Q has traveled much further up the paper than P, therefore is a smaller molecule. R is more polar than P. R has travelled less far up the paper than P, therefore it must be more polar than P. S is a smaller molecule than Q. S has not travelled as far up the paper as Q, therefore must be larger. This means C is the answer. Here we have some titration results. You are to work out what the average titer would be. You need to pick the two that are concordant, which is 2 and 4, 20.3 and 20.4. When we add these together and calculate the average, we get an average of 20.35. Question 25 is looking at an equilibrium reaction and the appearance of this reaction when conditions are changed. If we increase the pressure, this will move the equilibrium to the right, as that is the side of the reaction with less moles of gas. The statement here says that the, re the reaction will then become paler, this means that NO2 must be brown. By increasing the temperature, it causes the reaction mixture to become darker. This means that this must move the reaction in the direction of the endothermic reaction. We know that NO2 is brown, therefore the endothermic reaction must be the reverse reaction going to the left. 
This means that the forward reaction must be exothermic. Therefore, A is the answer. Thank you for watching my video. I hope that you found it helpful. Please remember to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new videos. You can also follow me on Instagram at Miss Adams Chemistry and Twitter at Miss Adams Chem for flashcards and updates on new videos. Bye for now.